Teaching Skills Methodologies Overview In this input, we'll look at the approaches and methods that have been used in the past and are being used now to look at language learning and teaching. An approach is a theoretical view of what language is and of how it can be learnt. An approach gives rise to methods, the way of teaching something, which use classroom activities, procedures and techniques to help learners learn. So the first one we'll look at is the grammar translation method, which came from teaching Greek and Latin a long time ago. The language was not taught for spoken communication, but to help students read and enjoy literature. Students had to memorize and recite rules and language. Many of the techniques from this method have been key to language teaching for a long time and are still important today. For example, the mother tongue, such as Chinese, is used to learn and talk about the second language, English. Students learn long lists of words and study grammatical rules. They then practice by using the rules and by translating from English to Chinese or the other way around. All methods have advantages and disadvantages. Advantages of the grammar translation method are that some learners respond to rules or enjoy grammatical analysis. It's a good way of comparing the first and second language to help develop language awareness. Less confident learners may enjoy the security of the first language being used. It also provides a basis for developing communicative skills. But we know there are also disadvantages. This method is not very meaningful and can be boring. Some words or phrases are difficult to translate accurately from one language to the other. The focus is on accuracy, so students may not develop fluency. So it teaches learners about the language, but not how to use it. Having had a quick look at this particular method now, Discuss with your peers what aspects of the grammar translation method you have used in your lessons and or how you may have been taught languages in the past. Pause the video and do this now. The Direct Method Berlitz is a global language education company and is one of this method's most successful proponents. The Direct Method is an umbrella term for a wide range of language teaching methods that emerged in the later part of the 19th century. They shared the belief that only the target language should be used in the classroom and that translation should be avoided at all costs. This method was a response to the growing demand for learning languages for the purposes of international commerce and tourism. This later metamorphosed into audiolingualism and the situational approach, but its core principle, the exclusive use of the target language, survives as an article of faith amongst many teachers. Having had a look at the direct method, discuss with your peers what aspects of this you have used in your lessons, or how you may have been taught languages in the past. Pause the video and do this now. The audiolingual method came from American Army education in the 1940s. The students learned by hearing and repeating the language until it became automatic. Some key ideas in this method were language is speaking, not writing. Classes are based on drilling, with lots of copying and repetition in common conversational situations. A language is a set of habits that the students must form. The advantages were that learners were able to use the language communicatively. They could easily understand the lesson as it's carried out in the mother tongue and learners were able to give correct responses automatically. Some disadvantages were that speaking or any kind of natural interaction is missing. Students don't have an active role in the classroom 
but are passively repeating the language. Very little attention is paid to real meaning. So, instructors try to find better ways to teach the target language. Having had a look at the audiolingual method, discuss with your peers what aspects of this you have used in your lessons or how you were taught languages in the past. Pause the video and do this now. As instructors of young learners, you would all be familiar with TPR. TPR stands for Total Physical Response and was created by Dr. James Asher in California in the late 1960s. The teacher or a student gives an instruction and the students all do the action associated with that instruction. Listening comes before speaking and it's learning by doing. TPR copies the way children learn their first language when the parent says things like, pick up the book and open your mouth. It works well for giving directions, songs and stories. TPR is based on the belief that learners need only input and don't need to speak until they're ready. This time is known as the silent period. Learners are exposed to input in the form of commands that require a physical response. As a method, it only had a marginal impact, but as a classroom technique, it is suited to the teaching of young learners. Some advantages and disadvantages now. TPR is great in the young learner classroom. It's fun and memorable because learners connect actions with language. It works well for younger learners and lower levels and is good for kinesthetic learners who like to move around and use their bodies. It can also be used with large classes and doesn't need a lot of preparation. Some disadvantages are that it can only be used for a limited range of language. Not all language can be used with actions. Some learners might be self-conscious and find this particular method embarrassing. And it's not always suitable for more advanced levels or older learners. The communicative language teaching approach was developed in the late 1960s. The goal here is of communicative competence, knowing when, where, and with whom to use the language for natural and meaningful communication. Here are some key ideas. Language is not just patterns of grammar with vocabulary, but also language functions, such as inviting someone to your home or to give a friend advice. Students should learn how to perform those functions using a variety of language structures. Students need lots of opportunities to see and hear English and to practice it. This is the way students will learn. In practice activities, students can use all and any language they know to communicate. The communicative approach is the best known current approach to language teaching. Communicative activities which mirror real-life use are implemented, where a strong perceived need among learners to communicate is key. Thus, the idea of language is about communication and not just rote learning words or rules is reinforced. So with this approach, there is a desire to communicate and a clear communicative purpose. Content and a variety of language is seen of greater importance than form which contrasts with previous approaches which considered grammatical competence of top priority. The teacher also intervenes less, with the idea that the students should speak more to each other. A methodology associated with communicative language teaching is task-based learning, which was popularised by a Professor Prabhu while working in Bangalore, India. Prabhu noticed that his students could learn language just as easily with a non-linguistic problem as when they were concentrating on linguistic questions. He speculated 
that students were likely to learn language if they were thinking about a non-linguistic problem, and that use of the target language became immediately applicable and relevant if they were using their linguistic resources to complete a task. The task has an outcome. The outcome measures the success of the task, and the task is meaningful for the learners. A focus on form can take place at any stage of the lesson. TBL is very popular in Chinese textbooks and is key in the national curriculum. The idea behind TBL is that students learn better when they are thinking about a task and not on the language they are using. Tasks could be designing a poster for the school cafe, planning a party, or leaving a message on someone's phone. Lessons follow this pattern. The students carry out a communicative task without specific focus on form. They report on the task and may listen to a fluent speaker doing the same thing. At the end, there's a focus on language form. The teacher highlights the language used, makes corrections and suggestions as to the student's performance. TBL has many advantages. Students use the language for real communication. The tasks and materials can be based on student needs and interests. This means students are likely to be motivated. They can use all their language resources in a natural way. Tasks can integrate all four skills, listening, speaking, reading and writing. However, TBL doesn't suit all learning styles, as some want to know the rules and learn the correct language first. It can be time-consuming in the classroom. It can help many students develop fluency, but there is less focus on accuracy. Some students may find ways to complete the tasks quickly without using the language much. It may also not match what's tested in current language exams. Something that is of great prevalence in schools now is CLIL, or CLIL, where other subjects are taught in the medium of English, or whatever the target language is, to students whose first language is not English. CLIL is also known as content-based teaching. So we've had a look at some approaches and methods. Now let's look at some different models for lesson staging. First we have PPP, Present, Practice and Produce. Have a look at what happens at each stage on the slide. Pause the video and do this now. The PPP procedure came under a sustained attack in the 1990s. Michael Lewis suggested that PPP was inadequate because it reflected neither the nature of language nor the nature of learning. Jim Scrivener advanced, what is perhaps the most worrying aspect of PPP is the fact that it only describes one kind of lesson. It is inadequate as a general proposal concerning approaches to language in the classroom. In response to these criticisms, many people have offered variations on PPP and alternatives to it such as ESA, ARC, and OHE. And here is one you'll recognize, ESA, or Engage, Study, Activate. These three components are usually present in any teaching sequence, whether of 5, 50, or 100 minutes. Another type of lesson staging used is the ARC staging, or ARC. Pause the video and have a quick read of the slide now. Authentic use might be a conversation stage that's designed to include the language that learners should practice. Restricted use could be a gap fill exercise on the language, and clarification and focus an explanation of rules on the board.
For test, teach, test, learners complete a task or activity without help from the teacher. Based on observations, the teacher presents the target language. Students do another task to practice the new language with increased awareness. This enables teachers to identify specific needs in a language area and address this need suitably. This is particularly useful at intermediate levels and above, where learners may have seen the language before, but have specific problems with it, and also in mixed level classes to help identify objectives for each individual. This could typically be used in a functional lesson, where students make suggestions about what visitors could do in their hometown. Without any guidance from the teacher, the students first do this while the teacher observes, i.e. the students are tested, and the teacher makes notes in what is lacking or in what could be improved in the language used. The teacher then gives the students guidance on what aspects could be improved or what language students need to know in order to do the task better. This is the teach part of the lesson. The students then do the task again, but this time incorporating what they were taught and presumably to do the task better, and so are tested again. This can be seen as a useful way for the learners to identify the gaps in their own knowledge and for the teaching to help them build upon a foundation on whatever language they already know. Deductive, inductive, and discovery learning. The presentation of target language can be done either deductively or inductively. In deductive learning, a situation is created in which the target item is presented in a meaningful context. Learners are told the rule or the rule is elicited. They then use the rule in practice activities. In inductive learning, the students look at a number of examples of the target language in context. They then work out the rule for use and form in pairs or small groups. In between inductive learning and deductive teaching is guided discovery. This is a technique where a teacher gives examples of a language item in context and helps the learners to find the rules themselves. For example, the learners are shown a problem page containing various examples of the second conditional, if I were you. They identify the structure and then the rules for making it. There are lots of advantages when you help your learners discover the language by themselves. The learners are active, so the language used becomes more memorable. It encourages independence so students can think and learn by themselves without the teacher. Working out the rules in pairs or small groups makes it a meaningful communicative task. The disadvantages are, however, that this type of learning doesn't suit all learning styles, because some learners and parents prefer more structure and guidance from the instructor. It can be time-consuming and may not suit the presentation of all new language items. So with all these different methods, approaches and staging, how are we to know which one to use and why? What works for many teachers is the eclectic approach. Nowadays, learners often learn through techniques from a variety of methods in what has been labelled an eclectic approach. Teachers select techniques from various approaches according to the different needs of their learners. A lot of the course books we use currently mix methods and techniques in this way. However, it's important to note here that not just anything goes. The methods used should be thought through carefully with students' needs or expectations in mind and teachers should be ready to explain why they are using that particular method if asked. The following need to be considered 
when deciding which methods to use. Students need constant exposure to language, since this is a key component of language acquisition. The students need comprehensible input, but this is not enough in itself. They also need some opportunity for noticing or consciousness raising to help them remember the language facts. Anxiety needs to be lowered for learning to take place. Showing how words combine together and behave both semantically and grammatically is an important part of any language learning program. We also need to consider the idea of developing explicit knowledge, which is knowing, understanding, and applying the rules of the language while learning it, as well as implicit knowledge, which is more like unconscious, subliminal, and natural language acquisition, how we would learn our L1. Where culturally appropriate, students should be encouraged to discover things for themselves, taking an inductive versus a deductive approach. Teaching methodology is rooted in popular culture. Therefore, compromise may be necessary. And on these last two points, let's expand a bit further. There's often a mismatch between teacher intention and learner interpretation. Our attitudes to the language and to the way it's taught reflect cultural biases and beliefs about how we should communicate and how we should educate each other. Many of the approaches and teaching methods are based on a very Western idea of what constitutes good learning. For example, American teachers working in other countries sometimes complain that their students have nothing to say, when in fact it's not an issue of the student's intelligence, knowledge or creativity which makes them reluctant to communicate, but their educational culture. Teachers need to understand student wants and expectations just as much as they are determined to push their own methodological beliefs. Now here's a task for you to discuss in your groups. Look at the procedure for a PPP lesson and identify the key stages. Now look at a TBL lesson on the same language point. What are the differences and similarities? The lesson plans for each have been uploaded onto this thread. We'll either discuss it in the next OT or ask you to post your ideas on the thread. So to sum up, in this input we've looked at what approaches and methods are and at some that have been used in language teaching and learning since the late 19th century. We've looked at how different approaches have given rise to different methods and at some of the advantages and disadvantages of each. You were also asked to consider which aspects of which different approaches you've used in your own teaching to date. We've also covered different types of lesson staging and asked you to take a look at two different types of lessons, PPP and TBL, and asked you to explore the differences and similarities. In the next section, be prepared to discuss which aspects of particular methods or approaches you've used in your own teaching and to talk about what methods or approaches might work in different situations. For the next OT, and also for your own reference, organize your notes to highlight the new theories, concepts and terms you've learned. Prepare any questions and comments that you want to raise in the next OT. Make a note of any insights you want to share. Thanks for watching and see you at the next OT.